A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindi News Analysis by Shankar Ayes Academy for the date 29th April 2021. These are the list of news articles taken for today's analysis. It has been provided along with the page numbers of different editions of Hindi newspaper. Now let us start our analysis with this first news article. This discussion is based on this news article which reports about the recent earthquake that was felt across northeast India, Bihar, West Bengal, Bhutan and Bangladesh. And according to the report by National Center of Seismology, the epicenter of this earthquake was at Dekhya Juli, which is a town in Assam. So in this context, let us see about earthquakes, the science behind it and also about the seismic hazard zones or the earthquake hazard zones. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, the earth's crust is a rocky layer of varying thickness. The crust does not occur as a single piece, but rather it consists of multiple portions called as plates which are of varying size. And the lithosphere of the earth is broken into a number of plates known as lithospheric plates. Now, these plates move around very slowly due to the movement of molten magma that is inside the earth. Now, such plate movements cause changes on the earth's surface. Now, one of the forces that causes these changes is the endogenic forces. It is the force which acts in the interior of the earth and they produce slow as well as sudden movements. And one among them is the earthquake. So, what is an earthquake? It is a sudden shaking or trembling of the earth which lasts for a very short time. It is a natural event that is caused by the disturbance deep down inside the earth's crust. Now, these disturbances lead to the release of energy which generates waves that travel in all directions. Or in other words, when the lithospheric plates move, the surface of the earth produces vibrations that travel all around the earth. And these vibrations are what are called as earthquakes. Now, how this is caused? See, the plates inside the earth are in continual motion as we saw. So, during their movement, they brush past one another or one plate goes under another due to collision. So, when these plates contact each other, stress arises and these stress results in release of energy and thus this energy causes disturbance in the earth's crust. And it is this disturbance that shows up as an earthquake on the surface of the earth. Now note that the release of this energy during an earthquake occurs along a fault. So what is a fault? A fault is a sharp break in the crustal rocks. Usually the rocks along a fault tend to move in opposite directions because the overlying rock strata presses these rocks which are moving in opposite directions. So, the friction between these locks them together, but their tendency to move apart at some point of time overcomes this friction. And as a result of this, the blocks get deformed and eventually they slide past one another abruptly. Now, this causes a release of energy whose waves travel in all directions. And remember that the point of rupture or the point where the energy is released is called as the focus of an earthquake. It is also called as hypocenter. Now, this focus or hypocenter can be located near the surface or deep below the surface. And the point on the surface that is directly above this focus is termed as the epicenter of the earthquake. Now, here additionally, let us also know about the vibrations caused by these earthquakes. As we saw earlier, the fault rupture generates vibration. And these vibrations are called as seismic waves. It means shock waves or earthquake waves. Now, these waves radiate from the focus, that is the point of rupture, and it radiates in all directions at various frequencies and velocities. Now, usually these vibrations travel outwards from the epicenter as seismic waves. And note that these waves are basically of two types. One is body waves, second one is surface waves. Now, these body waves are generated due to the release of energy at the focus, and they move in all directions, traveling through the body of the earth. And that is why they are called as body waves. And this is further subdivided into two types. One is primary waves and second is secondary waves. The primary waves or the P waves are those that move faster and are the first to arrive at the surface. Now, they are similar to sound waves and they can travel through gaseous materials, even liquid and solid materials. Now, the second subtype is secondary waves or the S waves. Now, these arrive at the surface with some time lag and note that they can only travel through solid materials. Now, the next type of waves is the surface waves. See, when the body waves interact with the surface rocks, it generates a new set of waves and these are called as the surface waves. Now, these waves move along the surface and they are more destructive. It is because they cause displacement of the rocks and this eventually leads to the collapse of structures. Now, how an earthquake is measured? It is measured with a machine called as seismograph. 
and generally the earthquakes are measured based on the magnitude or intensity of the shock now the magnitude of the earthquake is measured on the richter scale you'd have all heard about richter scale in news also we hear that uh, the earthquake was of uh, five richters seven richters etc so based on the estimation of richter scale an earthquake with six or higher magnitude is considered very strong and uh, earthquakes of 7.0 richters is classified as major earthquake and we also saw that based on uh, intensity of the shock also earthquakes are measured and this is measured using the mercalli scale which is used to calculate the earthquakes intensity now the mercalli scale expresses the intensity of earthquakes effect on people structures and on the earth's surface now the range of the intensity scale is from 1 to 12 Now this map provides you the distribution pattern of earthquakes in India and note that based on the intensive analysis of the past earthquakes India is divided into five earthquake zones these first two zones had experienced some of the most devastating earthquakes in India and these include the northeastern states uh, areas along the Indo-Nepal border in Bihar Uttarakhand then western himachal pradesh and kashmir valley the himalayan region and the kutch region of gujarat so these areas are included in the very high damage risk zone then the second type of zone is the high damage risk zone this includes the remaining parts of jammu and kashmir himachal pradesh northern parts of punjab eastern parts of haryana delhi western uttar pradesh and northern bihar all these fall under high damage risk zone category now the remaining parts of the country fall under the moderate to very low damage risk zones here note that most of the areas that can be considered safe are from the stable landmass covered under the deccan plateau so this is how earthquake hazard zones are provided in the ncert so we saw this now additionally you should also know that we have a seismic zoning map of india under this the whole country has been divided into four zones based on the historical seismicity and strong ground motions we have zone 5 to zone 2 initially we also had zone 1 but uh, it was later merged with zone 2 now out of these zones zone 5 exhibits the highest seismic risk and zone 2 has the least seismic risk So as you can see here zone 5 consists of parts of Jammu and Kashmir mainly the Kashmir valley then western parts of Himachal Pradesh eastern parts of Uttarakhand then Kutch region in Gujarat and also northeastern states and Andaman and Nicobar islands so you can see that the very high damage risk zones which we just saw is nothing but the zone 5 so similarly we can relate the high damage risk zone that is a second category with the zone 2 of seismic zoning map of india now just note that the seismic zoning map of india is prepared by bureau of indian standards now the other parts of the country which comes under the remaining zones is given here for your reference so from the news article we can say that now the earthquake has occurred in the zone 5 which consists of northeast india bihar etc so that is all about earthquakes how they occur then about earthquake zones or seismic zones etc now let's move on to the next discussion this discussion is based on this opet article which talks about antimicrobial resistance see the ongoing covid-19 pandemic has already killed over 3 million people globally especially the pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of the health systems across the world to the infectious diseases even in the richest countries so the spread of covid-19 has underscored the need for cross national cooperation to maintain global health security so in this context authors mention that covid-19 is just a beginning of the future crisis and they are focusing on another major crisis or uh, a greatest challenges that awaits the 21st century which is the antimicrobial resistance so in this context let us see in detail about antimicrobial resistance its causes and its impacts and the views of the author the syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference so first what are antimicrobials see these includes antibiotics antivirals antifungals and antiparasitics they are the medicines which are used to prevent and treat the infections in the humans animals and plants so what is antimicrobial resistance or in short amr it occurs when bacteria viruses fungi or parasites they change over time and they no longer respond to medicines that means it creates resistance to the antimicrobial drugs and this is what is called as the antimicrobial resistance now the issue with amr is that it makes harder to treat the infections and it increases the risk of disease spread and it also increases severe illness and deaths 
and as a result of the drug resistance, antibiotics and other antimicrobial medicines become ineffective and the infections become increasingly difficult or they become impossible to treat. Here just note that the microorganisms that develop antimicrobial resistance are sometimes referred to as superbugs. Now let us see why this AMR is a global threat. See as we already saw, the emergence and spread of drug resistant pathogens continues to threaten our ability to treat common infections. Especially the fact that is alarming is the rapid global spread of superbugs that cause infections that are not treatable with the existing antimicrobial medicines. Further, there is also a lack of access to quality antimicrobials, which also remains a major issue in many countries. Especially, antibiotic shortages are affecting countries of all levels of development. Further, the cost of AMR to the national economies and their health systems is significant because it affects the productivity of the patients and the productivity of their caretakers as they are forced to have prolonged hospital stays and it invites the need for more expensive and intensive care. So now, how this AMR arises? See, the important causes for rising AMR are the misuse of uh, antimicrobials in medicine, then inappropriate use of antimicrobials in agriculture, then also the contamination around the pharmaceutical manufacturing sites is also a reason for this. Now, the situation is worsening by the fact that no new classes of antibiotics have made it to the market in the last three decades. This means we are using the same kinds of antibiotics for the last three decades. And this is mainly because of inadequate incentives for their development and production and research and development of antibiotics and antimicrobials. So in this regard, the authors of this OPED article have provided certain data regarding antimicrobial resistance. According to them, over 95% of antibiotics in the development today are from small companies only because major pharmaceutical companies have largely abandoned innovation of new antibiotics. Further, according to the authors, AMR is already responsible for up to 7 lakh deaths a year. So if urgent measures are not taken, then the world would soon face an unprecedented health and economic crisis, which would result in 10 million annual deaths, that is 1 crore annual deaths, and it will cost up to $100 trillion by the year 2050. And this is one of the reasons why Authors mention that AMR represents an existential threat to modern medicine. It is mainly because with the increase in AMR, the most common surgical procedures, cancer, chemotherapy, etc., they will face risk from untreatable infections. And the scenario will be worse or more serious in the low-income countries and middle-income countries of Asia and Africa because already their health systems cannot bear the risk posed by the untreatable infectious diseases. And now when even treatable infectious diseases do not respond to the drugs, then the burden on their health system would increase exponentially. And that is why the Director General of WHO has said that antimicrobial resistance is a slow tsunami that threatens to undo a century of medical progress. See here, the logic is simple. For any infection, if a medicine is invented, then that means that infection can be treated with that medicine. Now, what will happen if that medicine becomes ineffective and there is no new medicine to treat that infection? This means that infection will continue and this will lead to increase in mortality rates and it will burden the health systems of the countries. So what is the way forward? How we could tackle this issue? The first and foremost need is developing of new antimicrobials so that even if the existing antimicrobials does not treat the infections, we can tackle that issue by administering the new antimicrobials. Then second, enforcing infection control measures to reduce the antibiotic use because we saw that misuse of antimicrobials is also one of the reasons for AMR. Then third measure could be a mix of incentives and sanctions that is ensuring that all those who need an antimicrobial have access to that medicine along with regulating its use. That is whether that medicine is properly used as told by the physician is not has to be properly checked. So that is why we are saying we need a mix of incentives and sanctions. And then we also need to track the spread of resistance in the microbes beyond hospitals. So this would encompass uh, the spread of resistance in the livestock, then the checking of wastewater and farm runoffs to test for the presence of antimicrobials, including antibiotics. Then finally, we also need sustained investment to detect and combat new resistance strains. And in this way, we already have 
the AMR Action Fund. It is a $1 billion fund that was launched in the year 2020 to support the development of new antibiotics. So we need more investments in this line so as to support developing of new antimicrobials and also to reduce its misuse. So these are some of the points that you should know about antimicrobial resistance. This topic mainly important from exam perspective because we already have a mains question in this regard as you can see here. So take note of the important points we just discussed. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Now this discussion is based on this news article which talks about the death of the astronaut Michael Collins. He is an uh, Apollo 11 astronaut and he piloted the spaceship from which Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin made their first steps on the moon in the year 1969. So in this light, let us discuss few facts about Apollo missions and also about Apollo 11. See, Apollo program was the name of NASA's project in the 1960s and early 1970s to land humans on the moon. This program consisted of 11 total space flights and among them, the first four flights tested the equipment used in the Apollo program. And the six of the other seven remaining flights landed on the moon. And you should note that the first moon landing took place in 1969 and the last moon landing was in the year 1972. And in all these missions, a total of 12 astronauts uh, walked on the moon. And these astronauts conducted scientific research and they studied the lunar surface. And they also collected moon rocks to bring back to Earth for research. Now, among these missions, the first manned mission to the moon was Apollo 8. But however, Apollo 8 did not land on the moon. It only orbited the moon after which it came back to Earth. But however, the first moon landing occurred in Apollo 11 mission that took place in July 1969. So, what was the primary objective of Apollo 11? It was to complete a national goal that was set by the then President of USA, John F. Kennedy, that is to perform a crude lunar landing and return to Earth. Now, apart from this, it also had other objectives such as scientific exploration by the lunar module, then deployment of a television camera to transmit signals to Earth, and then uh, deployment of solar wind composition experiment, etc. So on a whole, what you should remember is that the crew of Apollo 11 consisted of Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin. And among them, Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. So these are some of the important facts that you should know about the Apollo missions of NASA. Now let's move on to the next discussion. Now this discussion is based on this news article, which talks about the COVID portal. As you know, government has made vaccines available to all adults from May 1st. That is, those who are above 18 years can get vaccinated from 1st of May. And this is based on the new vaccine policy. Now, to get vaccinated, the individuals need to register in the COVID portal. But the news article mentions that technological glitches were experienced while registering in the COVID portal. It is said that the portal either crashed or people failed to get the one-time password. That is OTP. So in this context, let us know about COVID portal. See here, COVID stands for COVID Vaccine Intelligence Network. It is a cloud-based IT platform and it is supposed to handle minute details for India's COVID-19 immunization program. So this includes registering of beneficiaries, then allocating vaccination centers to the beneficiaries, then also sending text messages with the name of their vaccinator to the beneficiaries. Then it also includes live monitoring of vials containing vaccines in the cold storage. So in simple terms, COVID is an online platform for the citizens of India to register for COVID-19 vaccination and schedule their vaccination slots at the nearest vaccination centers. And besides this, it also monitors the vaccine stocks in the cold chain. Now know that this portal is owned by Ministry of Health, but it is managed by National Informatics Center of the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Now what are the major benefits of this platform? First, it regularizes the vaccination drive by allotting slots. Then it prevents proxy vaccination. That is, it ensures that no other person is getting vaccinated under the name of some other persons. And this is ensured because this platform helps to identify the beneficiary through Aadhaar. So this is the working of the portal. First, we have to register in the portal through our phone number and some proof of ID. And secondly, we have to select the hospital from where we want to take the vaccine. Then we have to confirm our slot and we have to proceed to the center of vaccination on the designated date and time. And note that once a person receives both the doses of vaccination, the individual gets a QR-based vaccine certificate. 
and most importantly remember that this platform is an extension of the even platform here even stands for uh, electronic vaccine intelligence network this network is an innovative technological solution that is aimed at strengthening the immunization supply chain systems across the country and this is for any vaccination now this innovative even was first launched in the year 2015 and it was launched across 12 states to support better vaccine logistics management at all cold chain points so this even supports the central government's universal immunization program and this is done by providing real time information on vaccine stocks and flows and by providing real time storage temperatures across all the cold chain points in the states and union territories now this even network is being implemented under the national health mission of uh, minister of health and family welfare now one of the benefits of this platform is that it has helped to create a big data architecture that encourages data driven decision making this in turn helps in consumption based planning that helps in maintaining the optimum stocks of vaccines now all of this helps in coordinating the demand and supply of the vaccines so because of even vaccine availability at all times has increased to 99% in most health centers but note that here we are talking about universal immunization program vaccines only and to deal with the covid-19 vaccination we have the covin portal so that is all about this discussion on covin and even now let's move to the next one our next discussion is based on this news article which talks about a report from a major swiss brokerage company called as ubs securities this company has given a report on the foreign portfolio investments and as per this report foreign portfolio investors have pulled out 2 billion dollars from indian equities due to the concerns over rising covid-19 cases so this is adversely affecting the economic recovery in our country and the report also speculates that they are likely to withdraw 3 to 4 billion dollars more in the short term so from this it becomes important for us to know about foreign portfolio investments see it is a type of foreign investment so what is a foreign investment it means an investment made by a person resident outside india on a repatriable basis in the capital instruments such as shares of an indian company so foreign investments are a part of india's capital account of balance of payments see as you know balance of payments records the transactions in goods services and assets between the residents of a country with the rest of the world for a specific time period such as typically a year so in this slide the other type of foreign investment is the foreign direct investment so now let us see about foreign portfolio investment and how it differs from fdi see foreign portfolio investment or fpi it means the investments that are made through stock exchanges that is through the secondary market and the investments will be made in various financial instruments like shares debentures of a company through this secondary market now according to sebi fpi is an investment in shares of a company not exceeding 10% of the total paid up capital of that company so any investment above 10% according to sebi is fdi so through this the foreign investor can exert control in the management of the company So let us see how for that we need to know about FDI. See FDI is an investment from a party in one country into a business or a corporation in another country and this investment is done with the intention of establishing a lasting interest. Here this term lasting interest is what differentiates the FDI from foreign portfolio investments because in FPI investors passively hold securities from a foreign country. and since we initially saw that the foreign investments are under a capital account of balance of payments so these fpi and fdi both are under capital account only now here the real difference between both these foreign investments is that fdi aims to take control of the company in which the investment is made but on the other hand fpi aims to reap the profits by investing in shares and bonds of the invested entity without controlling that company so that means fpi is a monetary investment or financial investment and it aims at getting profits from shares interest from deposits etc and it is also otherwise known as hot money now the foreign portfolio investor stays her money in the capital market only for a short period of time so its destination period is so small and it is empirically considered as fluctuating capital because it is often short term only so that means fpis are highly volatile they are a fair weather friend and speculative see here a fair weather friend means it cannot be relied on 
in times of difficulty. Then it also has other risks such as uh, foreign exchange risk. Then it may lead to capital flight. So here capital flight is the outflow of capital from a country due to many reasons such as uh, negative monetary policies, including currency depreciation, etc. And this also includes foreign portfolio investors pulling out from Indian market. This also leads to capital flight. And it also has other risks such as currency crisis, which in turn affects the real economic variables. So these are some of the points that you should know about foreign portfolio investment and how it differentiates from FDI and what are the risks in it. Now let's move on to the next discussion. This discussion is based on this editorial article, which is with respect to who should have control over temples whether government or the communities. So let us see the arguments by author who supports that communities should have control over the temples. The syllabus relevant to this discussion is given here for your reference. See, this is actually a reactionary article to the one published on 22nd April in the Hindu newspaper. On 22nd April's article, the author of that article had penned down the editorial in the context of freeing the temples in Tamil Nadu from government control. That is, on that day, the author of that article supported governmental control on temples. See, this was based on an act. See, initially, there was a Hindu Religious and Charitable Endowments Act of 1951, but this was replaced in 1959 by the Tamil Nadu Hindu Religious and Charitable Endowments Act. And under these acts, the temples were placed under the state control. Even Supreme Court had upheld this in its uh, Shirur Mat case, saying that it is perfectly in consonance with Article 25 of the Constitution. So since then, temples have been under the control of the Tamil Nadu state. So on that day, author favoured the opinion of retaining the temples with the governmental controls. And one of the main justification given by that author was that state control can prevent concentration of power in the temples with some powerful castes. But author of today's editorial article differs in this opinion. So the author has tried to give contrasting viewpoints in this regard. So in essence, we can say that in today's article, author has sided in favor of the community control of temples. So let us go over the arguments and counter arguments of both the authors one by one. Now first, the 22nd April article said that temples should be retained by the government because powerful castes may accumulate power and they may deny entry to the temple to certain sections of the society. But author of today's article is defending this idea by saying that it will not be possible for powerful castes to deny entry to certain sections of the society because the entry into temples has been regulated by Madras Temple Entry Authorization Act of 1947 and it has been enacted to address these issues only. So author of today's article is supporting that denial of entry is not possible legally. Now next, author of today's article also counters the previous article's views that said that Historically, kings always had a minister who was appointed to look after the temples. So by this, it was assumed that temples always had a significant supervision of the state. But in today's article, author has brushed this argument as a myth because there is lack of evidence to this fact. The next argument put forward by today's author is that the constitution allows state interference in the religion only to the extent of secular functions of the temple. See, if you look at Article 25, it empowers the state to regulate economic, financial, political or other secular activities which may be associated with religious practice. But however, according to the author, this state control is resulting in the state performing some non-secular functions also. For example, in a case law called the Sheshamal and others etc. versus state of Tamil Nadu, the court upheld that appointment of priests is a secular function. And according to the author, this is a stretched interpretation of the term secular. So, state should not be involved in such activities. Further, author also argues that the constitution does not permit the state anywhere to assume ownership of properties belonging to religious institutions. So, based on this, author stresses his point of relinquishing governmental control over temples. Then additionally, on that day, that is on April 22nd article, author of that article also looked into other religious endowment acts of other religions to support his viewpoint, where author also talked about the Waqaf Act and said that this act provided a significant government oversight. And even argued that even churches have been demanding governmental control on the institutions. But 
author of today's article has observed that the reading of the wakf act reveals that such government oversight applies to charities and it specifically excludes places of worship such as mosques so hence taking cues from uh, wakf act is also non justifiable for governmental control on temples according to today's author so finally to justify his opinion today's author of uh, the editorial has quoted british legacy see british government realized that a secular government should take no part in the management of religious institutions so british government at that time enacted the religious endowments act of 1863 and it repealed the pre existing bengal and madras regulations that allowed governmental control so in the process of handing over the religious institutions to the society the british government at that time even created committees in every district to exercise control over temples so by this author argues that even the britishers had a secular color in enforcing the secularism so as a conclusion author believes that it is justified both legally and morally for temples to be owned by community rather than the government but here we should not forget about the contrasting opinion which is that the temples control might slip into the hands of powerful castes and this may result in losing out on the social gains achieved by the temple entry so in this discussion we have given both the arguments that favor community control and also governmental control on the temples so based on this discussion viewers and aspirants can frame their opinion and they can take their stand with this we have come to the end of this discussion now let's move on to the next one Our next discussion is based on this news article which talks about the recently launched supply chain resilience initiative in short SCRI see this SCRI was formally launched by the trade ministers of three countries that is India Japan and Australia and this initiative is mainly launched to avoid the supply chain disruptions in the region see as you know covid-19 pandemic was having an unprecedented impact in terms of uh, lives lost livelihoods lost and economies affected apart from this the pandemic also revealed supply chain vulnerabilities globally and also in the region so since september 2020 high level consultations were held among australia india and japan and these consultations were focused on the importance of risk management and continuity plans in order to avoid supply chain disruptions in the future see a supply chain is nothing but a network between a company and its suppliers to produce and distribute a specific product to the final buyer and this network includes different activities people's entities informations and resources and the supply chain also represents the steps that is taken to get the product or service from its original state to the customer and companies develop the supply chain so that they can reduce their costs and they can remain competitive in the business landscape and it is also important because an optimized supply chain results in lower costs and a faster production cycle and that is why this initiative is important not only for india but also for the region so we can say that scri allows the commitments of these countries to strengthen resilient supply chains in the region now let us see some of important policy measures under scri first is supporting the enhanced utilization of digital technology and supporting trade and investment diversification then uh, the initial projects under scri includes sharing of uh, best practices on the supply chain resilience then the countries would also hold investment promotion events and buyer seller matching events and they will also provide opportunities for stakeholders to explore the possibility of diversification of their supply chains now apart from all this the ministers also decided to convene or meet at least once a year to provide guidance to the implementation of scri and they also directed their officials to meet as often as required to take the initiative forward so in simple terms scri aims to create a virtuous cycle of enhancing supply chain resilience this will eventually help to attain a strong sustainable balanced and inclusive growth in the region now as you know at present china is a part of the supply chain of most of the countries including india so we can say that scri aims to reduce the dependency on a single nation that is china but as a response to this initiative china's foreign ministry has described it as an unrealistic initiative so let us just to see how particularly this initiative helps india see as we just saw china is a part of supply chain of most of the countries and particularly china's share of imports into india in 2018 itself was 14.5 percentage if you just consider the top 20 items supplied by china 
And India is also fully dependent on China in areas such as active pharmaceutical ingredients for medicines such as paracetamol. And especially from the last year itself, we had bilateral issues with China. So in such a scenario, dependence on one country, that is on China, which is not our all-weather ally, makes us more vulnerable. So this initiative will help us to diversify our dependence. So it will insulate us from the vagary or unpredictability of a particular country. So that is all you need to know about this discussion. Now let's move to the next one. Now we have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. Now this is a previous year question that was asked in 2019 and it is about multi-drug resistance. We can also say antimicrobial resistance. The question asks, which of the following are the reasons for occurrence of multi-drug resistance in microbial pathogens in India? First option given is genetic predisposition of some people. This is not a reason, so it is incorrect. Second option given is taking incorrect doses of antibiotics to cure diseases. Now, this is a correct reason. Along with this, we can say that misuse of antibiotics is also one of the reasons. Now, the third one is using antibiotics in livestock farming. We saw this during discussion, so this is also a correct option. Now, the fourth one is multiple chronic diseases in some people. Now, this option is incorrect. And here the question asks for the reasons for the occurrence of multidrug resistance. So, the correct answer is option B, 2 and 3 only. Now, this next question is based on even portal. First statement is it is managed by National Informatics Center. This statement is correct. Second statement is it monitors the cold storage supply chains to ensure vaccine availability. This is also one of its objectives. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So, correct answer is option C, both 1 and 2. Now, this next question is based on foreign investments in India. First statement is foreign portfolio investments aims to take control of the company in which investment is made, but foreign direct investments aims to reap profits by investing in shares and bonds of the invested entity without controlling the company. This is an incorrect statement because it should be the other way around. FDI takes control over the company, whereas FPIs invest in the entity without controlling the company. Now, second statement is, in India, both FPI and FDI come under the capital account of balance of payments. This statement is correct. We saw this during the discussion. And here the question asks for the correct statements. So, the correct answer is option B, two only. Now, this next question asks, recently India has launched the supply chain resilience initiative in partnership with option A, South Korea and Japan, option B, Australia and New Zealand, option C, ASEAN countries, option D, Japan and Australia. And the correct answer is Japan and Australia which is option D. Now, this next question is, which of the following Apollo missions succeeded in making the first human landing on the moon? See here, you should be careful about the question. It asks the first human landing on the moon. And the correct answer is option A, Apollo 11. See, even though the first manned mission to the moon was Apollo 8, Apollo 11 only landed on the moon along with astronauts. And the crew members in this mission included Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins and Buzz Aldrin. And it happened in 1969. So option A is the correct answer. Now let us take two main questions. One is based on antimicrobial resistance and the other is based on regularizing religious institutions. You can answer these questions and post it in the comment section. With this, we come to the end of today's Hindi News Analysis. If you like the video, don't forget to like, comment and share. And do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for more updates related to civil service examination preparation.